perturbations of the area functional, right? So let me make the following computation. So zero is, so, so the first variation of the volume of the graph, let me indicate it in the following way, okay? Along a certain direction k, so this is uh, 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 kappa, actually, so now this should be the Greek kappa, but okay, tech is one thing and my handwriting is another thing. So this is the DDS derivative at s equals zero of the, uh, of the integral of here, the square root of one plus gradient of v plus s kappa, squared, and then I have all the minors, right? Okay, so this means I'm just making the perturbation V plus S kappa, and I'm taking S uh, arbitrarily small, and this is the usual first variation condition that you have. Okay, now let me, let me write down this first variation, so when you so when you, when you look at this first variation, you realize one thing, right? So this is going to be a very complicated expression, but if I tailor expand in dv, this complicated expression has the following form. So there is, I mean, since the Taylor expansion of the functional gives you the Dirichlet energy, the Taylor, I mean, as a first order, as a second order somehow, the zero order is one, the variation of one is equal to zero. Then you have the second order expansion, which is the Dirichlet energy, and the variation of the Dirichlet energy is going to be dV d kappa. Right, so here I'm, I'm just indicating the uh, Hilbert-Schmidt scalar product between the derivative of V and the derivative of kappa, okay? Then you have all these guys. But you see, these guys, they are, okay, these guys and the Taylor expansion for this one also. But they are quartic in dV. So if they are quartic in dV, their derivatives are cubic in dV. And so the Taylor expansion here gives you something which I can estimate as like, you know, big O of dV cubed d kappa. Okay, now let me just stress that it is fundamental that here you have the power three, okay? I mean, this is something smooth in dV. If you were to Taylor expand, you would expect a linear part, this is dV, a quadratic part in dV squared, a cubic part in dV cubed, and so on. But actually the Taylor expansion is skipping the dV squared. And the reason why it is skipping the dv squared is because when you look at the functional, the functional, the, the Taylor expansion of the functional is one plus dv squared divided by two, and then there is no third order term. The next order term in the Taylor expansion is quartic, okay? So that is fundamental. If you want, the fact that I'm able to make a C3 estimate, it's because the Taylor expansion actually skipped this quadratic term. Okay, so, now, this is actually telling me, so for abbreviation, let me, let me call the first variation in the following way. So let me write it as del of graph of V, right, in kappa. So this is equal to zero, okay? And so, okay, so what it tells me is that the integral of uh, dv dot d kappa is less or equal. And now I want to be a little bit more careful on this estimate over here. So let's put 
the C1, I mean the C0 norm of D kappa Okay, and then I have the integral of dv to the power 3. Okay, so I actually take the C0 norm of dv over here. Okay, and then I have the integral of dv squared. But the integral of dv squared, I know it's comparable to the cylindrical excess. So the integral of dv squared, I will replace by this estimate. Okay, but this, is, this has a Lipschitz constant. The Lipschitz constant over here, so the Lipschitz constant of this guy, is E L of L to the power two minus two delta to the power gamma, okay? Again, you see this power gamma coming. I, I have gamma here, I have one here, so I can write it as less or equal than dk constant c0. Then I have e, I have l of l to the power m plus two minus two delta times one plus gamma. And again, I played the game that I played before. I want actually, I mean, I, I choose, uh, I've chosen uh, delta so small that this actually becomes a little bit more than two. Okay, so I end up with the following estimate. So I have then less or equal than a constant E L of L to the power M plus two plus beta. And then I have D kappa in C zero. Okay, so that's interesting, but I actually want to, I actually want to make the estimate for the approximation F bar, the Lipschitz approximation of V. Um, oh, actually, I uh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. So, um, right. So I did it in the wrong order. No, I think it's correct actually. Yes, sorry, you were saying. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I actually have one plus something on 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 e. Okay. Okay, now what I want to say is actually that, so I'm not sure actually I did things in the correct order. So maybe I wanted to do this on F bar instead of doing it in V. Uh, so I might actually have mixed up the order, but in, in the notes you have the correct order. Uh, I actually want to claim now the same estimate on this guy. So on D F bar times DK. Okay. And the idea is the following that, so I want to compute the uh, uh, I mean, I, I want to compute the first variation of the graph of F bar, which is the approximation, and subtract the first variation of the graph of uh, V in kappa. Okay, I know that this I know that this first variation is equal to zero. But out of uh, uh, simple computations, I know also that this first variation is less or equal than so this first variation is less or equal than the m-dimensional volume of the difference between the two graphs. the symmetric difference between the two graphs times the C0 norm of D kappa, okay? So that is 
a rather elementary computation. And now we already saw what is the m-dimensional volume, I mean, what is the difference in the m-dimensional volume of these guys? Well, this is less or equal than a constant times the place where they disagree. So the, 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 the complement of the coincidence set OK, and the coincidence set we already show it has an estimate. I mean, the, diff the, the complement of the coincidence set we already show it has an estimate of the following kind. So this came actually in the previous argument, if you remember, right? So we were estimating the L1 norm of Fj minus Fj minus 1. And what we used is that the coincidence set between Fj and Fj minus 1 had this estimate, I mean, the complement of the coincidence set. Of course, that is because we were saying that Fj and Fj minus 1, they actually agree with the same function. OK, so now. I was doing, uh, so I was doing, so you, you maybe see something. I, okay, so this is equal, okay, so this is equal to zero. Now I have this estimate on this first variation. I actually should have done the Taylor expansion, not on V, I should have done the Taylor expansion on F bar, okay? So instead of doing all the Taylor expansion on V, do all the Taylor expansion of F bar, okay? So and, and instead of knowing that this first variation is equal to zero, you know that this first variation has this estimate. Okay, so sorry for making this mistake, but if you did, okay, so this is not equal to zero, so the Taylor expansion must be done on F bar now. So you can repeat just all the argument with F bar instead of V, and actually it's on F bar that we have the better uh, estimate over here. So this is really F bar. Okay. OK, and this is not an estimate, so this is an estimate for this guy. OK, and then since actually you know that for this one you have the estimate, you end up having uh, the, following, the following final estimate. So the F bar product with dk is less or equal than a constant. And then you have E. So here you have this L of L to the power m plus 2 plus beta. And then you have dk c0. OK, so now if you, OK, so if you are a PDE oriented person, what do you see over here? Well, I mean, you could integrate by part, and you have the Laplacian of f bar against the test function. And then you have an estimate where here there is the derivative of k actually appearing. Okay? So you can think about it as a w minus 1, 1 estimate for the Laplacian of f bar. That is what it is, right? Because I mean, if I want the w minus 1, 1 estimate, I test with some test function. And then there is one derivative following on the test function. That's for the minus 1. And then since I'm using a c0 estimate over here, by duality, this will be like a nl1 estimate on the other guy. Okay? So this is just to sound fancy. So now we are almost done. So I'm not going to show you the, the higher. Uh, derivative estimates on the Laplacian of f bar, but I can show you right away the estimate on the Laplacian of f bar. So how am I actually estimating the Laplacian of f bar, uh, for instance, in C0? OK, so uh, um, sorry, not of f bar, of z. OK, and z is the convolution of f bar with uh, a certain kernel. OK, so how am I going to estimate the Laplacian of this z? OK, so, um, so I want a c0 estimate. So I just say the Laplacian of z in c0 is actually the soup with test function, say, psi in L1 of the integral of Laplacian of z times psi, OK? 
Okay, now you see this is the supremum for psi in L1 uh, less or equal than one, sorry. So this is equal to the supremum with L1 of psi less or equal than one, and then I stick in the definition, Laplacian of Z, so this is Laplacian of F bar star phi L of L, okay? And now the first thing that I do is I integrate by parts. So if I integrate by parts, I get gradient of F bar star phi L of L times psi. And then since I have a convolution, I can actually put the convolution on the other, so there is a derivative here, sorry. So since I have a convolution, I can actually put the convolution on the other side, okay? So put the convolution over here, and I'm ending up with the estimate that the C0 norm of the Laplacian of Z bar, did I call it Z bar or Z? Uh, Z. So the Laplacian of Z in C0 is then less or equal than the supremum over psi in L1, okay, and then I have the integral minus the integral of the F bar, and then here I have the psi star phi L of L. Okay, and now it's nice because that's exactly my kappa, right? So now I use the uh, the estimate on the kappa, right? So the integral of df bar d kappa is going to be bounded by this quantity. So, so here I can actually put a constant e l of l to the power m plus two plus beta, and then I have the supremum over all psi in l1 less or equal than one, and then I have the derivative of psi star phi L of L in C0, right? Because this is what, I mean, this is my D of kappa, okay? And I'm using that estimate over there. Okay, and now it's an obvious, it's really an obvious thing, right? So uh, uh, the elementary estimates on the convolution between two things tells you, aha, the C0 norm of the convolution of, uh, I mean, of the derivative of that convolution Okay, so this guy can be estimated with the L1 norm of psi and then here you need the C0 norm of the derivative Okay, well the C1 norm, I mean the L1 norm of psi is less or equal than one, so this one you can just forget about. And what is the size of this? Huh? So phi L is, I mean it, it gets a one over L to the power of M because of this scaling of the convolution. And then since you're taking one derivative, it gets another power of L downstairs. Okay, and this constant is just the C0 norm of the function d phi, of your mollifier that you have uh, fixed. Okay, so now plug this inside this estimate and you see the m plus two plus beta is there. I lose an m because of this, I lose a one because of that, and my final estimate is this guy. Okay. So what happens when, because I promised you estimates on the higher derivatives, right? So what happens if I have a higher derivative over here? Well, if I have a higher derivative over here, I will have a higher derivative over here, and I will just put all the higher derivatives integrating by parts on the convolution, and then I will put all the other derivatives always on the convolution kernel. And each time that I have a derivative, I lose a power of L in the denominator. And so if I want to estimate the Laplacian of the first derivative, 
I will lose this one of the second derivative, then I will get the minus one, and so on. Okay, so now <laughs> the L1 estimate. So if you just, I mean, okay, so for the L1 estimate, there is a specific computation, it's in the, in the lecture notes. It's a kind of tricky computation. But the basic idea is the following. So it's obvious that you must have some L1 estimate, okay? It, it, it's kind of, I mean, it has to be this, the case. You can just look at the case in which the excess is equal to zero. When the excess is equal to zero, the function is just harmonic, right? So uh, this estimate that we have here, right? This is telling you that the function f bar is almost harmonic, right? Which is actually what was already the George's uh, intuition. So if this one is equal to zero, the function is exactly harmonic. And if the function is exactly harmonic and I'm convolving it with a radial kernel, it stays the same because the harmonic functions have the mean value properties. So by this, you can believe that the estimate is at least correct when e is equal to zero, <laughs> right? Okay, now, if you believe that there's going to be an estimate, the scaling of the estimate is the correct one that I've given you, right? So if the derivatives are scaling, if the Laplacian of the derivatives are scaling in that way, the L1 norm of the difference must scale in a way which is compatible. And this is this m plus three plus beta. So it's the only natural estimate that you can hope for, okay? You could also just say, okay, so if I get an estimate out of rescaling, it has to be with that particular power of L, okay? But then, okay, the lecture notes actually gives you uh, proof. And, um, well, for once, I even finished uh, according, well, almost according to schedule, let's say. I mean, I, I can for once give you five minutes for questions, actually. <laughs> Thanks. Uh. Right, so assume you don't have a Lipschitz graph, but you still know that you are covering once. So the important point is to get uh, this, Lipschitz approximation, uh, this Lipschitz approximation theorem, right? So if you have this Lipschitz approximation theorem, as, as, you, as you're seeing in these estimates, what I'm really doing is I'm saying, uh, I have this Lipschitz approximation, and the difference between my area minimizing surface and the Lipschitz approximation has a certain accuracy. If I have that accuracy, then I can actually carry on exactly the same computation. So if I had a situation in which I'm not a Lipschitz graph, but I still know that I'm covering once, so I'm not going to have two graphs which are approximating it, but just one guy. The uh, difficult part is to get this Lipschitz approximation theorem. So that is like the kind of technical uh, way. So I can give you just one heuristics. So uh, all I did was I used this maximal function truncation and then I was just making comparisons. Okay, so the maximal function truncation, you have to cook up a version of that in your uh, kind of geometric measure theoretical situation in which you have a current, for instance, okay. And that is possible and it's um, kind of something which was discovered actually not not uh, too long ago, like, I mean, it's in the outcome of research in the last 20 years, somehow. So the Lipschitz approximation that the Georgi and other people were using before uh, um, was uh, kind of um, um, following a different algorithm. Yeah, and what do you call Right. Right, because, okay, so this is the situation in which you cover once. Assume that you have a multiple cover. When you have a multiple cover, I don't want to actually show you that the whole object has this regularity because it's not possible. I want to show you that there is an average. So this, I mean, this, this basic construction algorithm will actually be done in the following way. So you have a cube where your excess is small, you take the cylinder, which we took in the tilted system of coordinates. Now, you don't have an approximation with a single Lipschitz graph. You have an approximation with what is called a multigraph. A multigraph is something more complicated than the, the superposition of two Lipschitz graphs. I mean, somehow, it's, it's generally multivalued. Okay, then you take the average of the sheets, and then you make this uh, modification. 
Only the thing is going to be much, much more complicated because you don't have uh, uh, the Georgi success decay. So instead of having this regular grid, you will have an actual Whitney decomposition with several stopping time conditions on the cubes. And uh, uh, there is a complement which you're not covering with the cubes, which, which is a kind of uh, good set, where you actually have all the possible decays. And then you actually have the stopped cubes in which you, know, you, you have just stopped them because uh, essentially the, 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 the graph, I mean the multigraph kind of uh, separated and the sheets are far enough from each other. And like the Lipschitz approximation in that particular case is like one single step. It, it requires one, one whole paper actually to do that in the multigraph situation. Okay, I guess we are on time, so thank you very much.